Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Fish East Live. I'm your host, Donald Patterson. Um, really excited about tonight's show. We're, we're, we're going to explore something that at some point in time or another, most of us have, you know, ventured into, and that's cooking what we catch. And uh, whether it be at home or on the shore, you can turn some amazing freshly caught fish into, into an incredible meal for you, your family, and your friends. So let's start this evening by bringing in my co-host, my partner in crime, Mr. Matt Zito. Matt joining us once again. How are you, Donnie? Not bad, man, and you? Oh, I'm great. I'm great. You're looking forward to uh, maybe giving away some chain pickerel secrets this evening? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to give away all my secrets, but you know what? Uh, I want to share it because it's, uh, it's a great recipe and chain pickle are a great eating fish, so I don't mind sharing this one. Yeah, no, and I can vouch for that. Now, normally I start the show with, you know, a, a beverage of some sort sitting beside me. And yes, tonight I do have a water bottle, but the main focus I had when I got home tonight was to make sure I had supper. Because I've had Matt's chain pickerel tacos, and I know how hungry I would be watching him prepare them and not being able to enjoy them. And unfortunately, you know, I don't think I'm going to take a drive to Halifax tonight just for a fish taco. So uh, I'm going to have to flash back to this past summer on the shore of uh, Raynard's Lake, was it, in Yarmouth? It was there we Raynard's go. we were on, yeah. There it is. Uh, just outside of Yarmouth. And... Uh, you know, so, some absolute, and that was my first time trying chain pickerel. And, you know, I have to admit that it probably Cajun battered brook trout. Now, there's something I haven't tried. Uh, I'll be, I'll be honest. I don't think I've ever had battered trout, but uh, you haven't either. I have either. No. So, well, I'm not opposed. I'm, I'm not, not opposed, opposed either. Um, Matt, I'm going to let you get ready to uh, start this cooking fiesta. And we're going to bring in our special guest, uh, St. John restaurateur, entrepreneur, uh, just all-around avid outdoorsman, Mr. Peter Stoddard. And I'm going to find out if he's ever had uh, battered <laughs> trout. Uh, you... No. I don't I, think I, I have, I, actually. Maybe I rainbow think... trout. Maybe I had rainbow trout battered in a restaurant. And I've had battered salmon in a restaurant. But I have not had brook trout battered. Well, I think. But we I presume it's good. good. Everything's good battered. <laughs> really, everything's good fried, whether it's in yeah. batter or not. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. But I think bread. I think we may I think we may have found something that we all have to try this season. I think so. <laughs> so, Matt, we'll let you step aside um, and get ready for this the, the, this little cooking escapade that we're about to go on. We'll give the folks at home a minute to get to know Peter. Uh, you know, Peter, first off, thank you for joining us. Um, you and I had an you and oh, our pleasure. You and I had an opportunity to meet this past summer uh, when we traveled and visited you at, I guess, what was now your former business. Uh, yep. You are no longer officially involved there, but uh, nonetheless, you know, an, an, an unbelievable experience that we had with you and Jesse at the St. John Ale House. Yeah, the home of the best fish and chips. Oh, <laughs> it was uh, it was a phenomenal, phen phenomenal plate of fish and chips for sure. Yeah, we still course. have some more videos to come out, so I can't say Don't officially say too much. who had the best fish and chips. But uh, you know, let's just Unoff say you, unofficially. You, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> Don't you're not dragging me down that, that path. Um, okay, but I, I will say that uh, you guys were our first filming of the year last year, and. Uh, you set the bar really, really high. So, you know, well, Jesse does an awesome job there, right? Yeah. Man, exactly. That man knows his way around some food. That's for sure. So, yeah, my wife and I went down a while ago and not that this has anything to do with, you know, the fish you're catching and, and cooking on the shoreline or to bring it home. But, uh, you know, a, a trip to St. John is hardly ever complete without uh, a stop into the ale house. So that's right. And I, of course, <laughs> it's all locally sourced fish, right? Yeah. Uh, so. Jason Wilcox, definitely amazing <laughs> fish and chips there, can confirm. <laughs> so, Excellent. Yeah, Love well, it. and I mean, Jason spends his fair fair share of time around fish, uh, you know, so I'm guessing yes, he he's, does. Had plate, he's had a plate of fish and chips or two in his lifetime. Yeah, so. I assume that currently he's making some burbot and chips. 
by the sounds of things. He's been on the burbot pretty heavy. So, uh, you know, I don't know about burbot and chips. That's something we'll have to ask him about. Jay, if you're, if you've done up burbot and chips, drop a comment, let us know how it was. So Peter, why don't you tell folks a little bit about yourself um, and what attracts you to the outdoors and, you know, basically, you know, why cool. catch and cook? What, 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 what's the appeal? Well, uh, I guess I've been, I've been hunting and fishing in my whole life br- brought up with it. My dad, you know, would take us, uh, on trips doing both. Um, so there's a, that nostalgia that comes with it. Everything from, you know, being lucky enough to get a limit of, of trout and bring them home and do, you know, that was always our, our kind of staples. We want to go to spot and get some trout but you know we would take trips to nova scotia and fish mackerel off the wharves and um always my grandfather had a uh, a trout pond on his property down there and we go catch trout out of that so you know i kind of grew up with a with that type of wild fish meal and then of course there's uh you know as you progress through life and you try different things and got into the restaurant world a bit and there's a big connection there with especially local ingredients and and you know wild wild meat be it the uh, deer birds ducks fish sh- shellfish the whole lot i mean that's the probably the healthy healthiest source and sustain uh, sustainable presuming you're, you're in a sustainable scenario fish you can get like it's naturally raised and and uh, harvested and it's a ton of fun doing it and you can feel the connection with nature so and generally speaking i just like being outdoors i like being in the woods i like hiking and climbing through the woods and finding new streams and finding new techniques and and of course meeting you know folks like yourself and all my buddies that we grew up with and going on trips together it's nothing better and everything always tastes better in the woods it definitely does. And I yeah. think that's, you know, part of the appeal for me, especially with this recipe that Matt's doing tonight. Like I said, I mean, I watched him prepare prepare this same dish uh, on the tailgate of a Dodge half ton. You know, alongside <laughs> that's some incredible skills right there. Yeah, it is. So yeah. I think he's got a little bit better. You know, I see his cameras back on there now, so I'm sure yeah. he, he can hear us. Um, you know, is that the type of setup that you would see for your traditional shore lunch pete would be you know what matt's got going there yeah i don't think so yeah that's uh that's uh <laughs> that's impressive that's that's i would refer to that as some incredible mise en place he's got uh some chopped up romaine some limes some um spring onions avocado beef eater tomatoes cilantro like garlic that's like i'm looking forward to watching him put this together i I think I can see in his head where he's going with it. And I think that uh, we'll probably dive into that a bit, but the traditional shore lunch isn't is kind of like fried fish and maybe some potatoes and some tartar sauce and that kind of thing. But I think as, as we, uh, as the culinary aspect of the world increases, it's not that hard to kind of grab these type of ingredients and bring them with you on a road trip and really elevate the, uh, the traditional shore lunch. So I'm interested to see what's going to happen here. That's a well, exactly, Matt. I mean, I kind of know what direction he's going. So, Matt, why don't you give the folks at home and give our give, give our guest a little bit of an idea of just what you've got going on? Yeah. So uh, this is basically all the ingredients are going to go into my fish tacos. I got some stuff off to the side. Uh, obviously, my fish is off to the side, and my seasoned uh, panko crumbs are over there. But uh, I'm going to start first. I already made, pre-made one sauce, which is a chipotle mayo. So in the chipotle mayo, it's mayonnaise, uh, a chipotle pepper, um, and uh, some uh, lime juice, salt, garlic. And I just uh, hit it with the food processor, blend it all up. And uh, the next sauce I'm going to do is a, uh, is a lime... Uh, a uh, avocado, uh, sour cream avocado sauce, I guess. It's just something I kind of came up with, so. Okay, well, we'll let you work away on that. Um, Pete, before we get too much further into this, as I said, you've kind of moved on from your, your ventures with Jesse in the Ale House, and you've moved on to some new stuff. Um, what direction is life taking you now? 
Yeah, well, I took. I had a nice uh, kind of fall, I guess, when uh, when the dust settled on everything, and I spent an incredible amount of time in a deer stand. So that was a ton of fun. And uh, so I'm currently working with uh, the tourism department for the province, um, working on some hunting and fishing strategies and marketing and kind of growing that sector a bit here in the province. So it's kind of near and dear to my heart. So um, it's been interesting so far and really looking forward to really diving in. I kind of just got started with that. So this is kind of part of it, I guess. We're showing people, you know, what you can do with some New Brunswick fish and like I've been, I've been fishing pickerel, which is why I was interested in Matt's recipe my whole life. One of my funniest stories, um, my dad and I were fishing out of the old tin boat, uh, kind of before we were even really targeting pickerel and, and, uh, I hooked this pickerel and of course I got it close to the, close to the boat and it broke the line cause we didn't have leaders then. And we were fishing with spinners and worms and this big fish came and took it and so I lost it and I retied and I threw it back into the same spot and I caught the fish again and brought it up and it still had the lure in his mouth from what he had broke off. And I said, oh, that's, you know, so I've been battling those guys my whole life. Yeah, no, that's, pickerel was kind of my start into the the sport fishing. I, you know, I did the the, the obligatory, you know, country boy fishing as a kid, never, never really got heavy into it. And then you know, a little later in life, right around the time I turned 30, I got into it and pickerel were really my first target species. And, you know, they're a lot of fun. And oh, you know, God. I could fish them all day long. And sometimes yeah. you hit them and they're just, they, you, you get anything within 20 feet of them and they'll hammer it. And other times they'll, you can drag it over their head and they won't turn sideways. And that's when you, that's when you got to have 367,000 lures in the boat so you can try four of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what feels right today. Exactly. But they're so. a ton of fun to catch, my God. Well, at the end of the day, anything fun to catch. Yep, exactly. So, no, it's... They're uh, so plentiful, too, around, you know. So, um, well, they are plentiful. And I guess that leads me to one of the things that we kind of wanted to touch on. Um, when we're harvesting for catch and cook... You know, people talk about sustainable harvest and ethical harvest and responsible harvest. That can take you in so many different directions. And, you know, I think people need to stop and, and think about that when they are harvesting. Because, yes, pickerel are abundant. We can go out and harvest a significant number of those. And I'm not saying you can't harvest other fish, but so many people are overlooking good eating fish because they have one mindset. You know, and I yeah. think that's a shame for our fisheries because some species will suffer while others are, I guess, thriving. Um, and, and we just have to get people to change focus. If you want to feed, you want a good feed of fresh fish. Yeah. Why, you know, why can't you go catch some pickerel? Why does it have to be trout this week? You know, and I think people need to realize the diversity we have here. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, I mean, you know, when you're talking about some treasured species that we have that are, you know, across North America, like white perch, yellow perch, um, those they're the abundance of that species. I mean, your limit that's designated by biologists in the province, clearly there's a sustainable fishery there and they're delicious. My son, he loves doing a shore lunch and he loves white perch because they're a ton of fun to catch. And in most of the waterways on the St. John River system, they're all over the place. Yep, exactly. And they're fun through the ice and they're fun in the spring when they're running up rivers and they're great eating. You yeah, can they scale you know, them up and roast them whole or you can fillet them and. Yeah, maybe no. ceviche. I don't know. We kind of touched on that, but we, we touched on that before yeah. we came on the air. And, you know, I know one, you know, good friend who who has basically said that uh, you know his panfish obsession from you know his time in Upper Canada has been replaced here in the Maritimes with with white perch. Yeah. You know, you know, we don't have black crappie or or anything or fish there. You no, know, like anything of that class, I guess, of panfish. Um, but he discovered white perch and is absolutely obsessed with them. Yeah. 
you know, not just not and not just a catch to eat. Like, yeah, got more you. patience, more uh, Gavin, Gavin Whittier. How you doing tonight, Gavin? Good to see you with us. You know, has way more patience than I do to try and clean and fi like fillet that a yeah. cooler full of white perch. Yeah, it's uh, I got one of those electric uh, fillet knives last year for that reason because you can just whip through them, but. You know, there's other, there's more than one way to skin a cat, if you will. The uh, I've had success uh, roasting whole fish, and especially with perch. You know, you can scale them, you can slice the side, you can make a little uh, chili sauce, throw them straight on the grill, and they just come right apart and pick the meat out. If you don't want to yeah. go through all the trouble of, uh, you know, I mean, you got to bleed them out, cut them, get. Um, Get get them all cleaned up and then fire them on the grill. Give them a little olive oil, salt, and pepper, man. Boom. Yep. Yeah, seeing a, seeing a lot of people chiming in saying how delicious perch are. I'm There's Terry, Terry Lynn. She likes you, it when I cook some white perch for her. Nice, nice. Cool. You mentioned uh, <laughs> roasting whole fish, and I think my brother may have done this last spring with a fish that we caught out here. Uh, good to good good to see you joining us tonight, Ben. Hi, Ben. Pay attention to the Kennebecasis River. Ben puts in a lot of hard work down there. Um, speaking of the Kennebecasis River, the fish that I think my brother roasted whole was an American shad. Oh, oh yes, sir. Shad, you know, here in the, 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 the Kennebecasis River, just five minutes out the road from my house. Yep. And, uh, phenomenal fishery and one that a lot of people don't because they're bony. You know, they're, they're hard to scale. You know, so a lot of people shy away from them. And yeah, if you I learn think. the right techniques. And the, the beauty of nowadays is if you want to catch a, and cook a fish, you just Google how to cook that fish or yep. clean it. You know, it's not like you need to have a, a library of books to figure out how to cook a shad or Gaspero that are a ton of fun to catch. Uh, they're also quite challenging. I've, I've chased shad forever. Uh, and gas bro. And, you know, if, if you get a fly rod and you get in a situation where you're hooking a 25 inch shad, like you're in for a party <laughs> yeah. and, and it's a great big fish and they're, they're in all the rivers that, you know, come from the bay. Yeah. Yeah. We, awesome. uh, we, we, it was just, Oh, it was this past spring. Um, we were, it was after COVID, but after the first bunch of restrictions started loosening, we were able to get a few people together and we had nine guys. It was either after COVID or just before, but we had nine guys lying in the shores of the Kennebec cases out back here from my house and, you know, just made a day of it. And, you know, it's, you know, a few guys took fish home to eat. Most of it was catch and release, but that's, that's part of the joy of this. Well, yeah, so. when you're fishing shad in the Kennebec cases or Hammond River or any of the tributaries and you're, like I've, I've been in scenarios where this, you can see the school coming and you can see the ripples coming up the river, right? Like, and then you're, you're kind of wondering what they are. The first time I remember I was in the Hammond River, I saw it and, and uh, we're fly fishing for trout. And all of a sudden the school comes up and you look in the water and they're, and they're, uh, they're just ripping by. There's Ian. Sh Shad is the poor man salmon. I they're, uh, yeah, they, uh, they literally like, you know, they school around you and it's, there's so many of them and they're not shy like a salmon would be. And, uh, they just kind of spin around and they'll stay in some of those pools for days on end. So when you find them, you can, you can target them day after day after day, try different yeah. stuff. And you if know. you, if you catch the first of the run, they seem to run in intervals. So you'll get a wave come up. They'll sit in a pool for a couple of days, then they'll move on. But a day later, the next school replaces them. And yeah, so, uh, but uh, Matt, how are you making out there? I, I see all kinds of knife action going. That's uh get some uh, pretty solid knife skills here. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah. I am uh, just getting the Pico ready. Uh, and then I'm going to blend up my um, avocado sauce here in a second. Avocado sauce. You, I don't remember you blending anything in Yarmouth. <laughs> well, I didn't really have that capability out there. Oh, but, come on now. You don't have a blender hooked up to the battery of your truck? Not yet. <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah, that'll be this year's project. So. Yeah, right. I guess 
Pete, what's your absolute favorite fish, whether it be to catch on the shoreline or to bring home and cook at home? What's your absolute favorite and your favorite way to prepare it? You know, I'm one of those guys that doesn't typically have any favorites, but I am a favorite of having a happy wife. And <laughs> she is a huge fan of striped bass. Yes. So uh, I usually make a few trips a year if I can up to the Miramichi and uh, usually get a couple fish and there's you know i mean you get a good size um striped bass you that's like that's that's a good summer's worth of food really you know depending on how much you eat it and and she loves it so i make sure that i bring that back and i like to do uh you know sometimes a simple pan sear with that or uh obviously the the uh fried you can't beat deep fried fish like that's a that's kind of the tradition it's at when you go into that realm it's kind of like what's what are you going to put around it you're going to do beer batter you're going to do breading you're going to do you know just simple flour salt and pepper um and then to me when you're when you're cooking any type of uh fish it's not just about how you're making it it's what's going with it so or, or what are you putting it in so you know are you doing a stir fry with a piece on top or are you making the uh, like, a, I have a, I have like a kind of like a tartar, so a version of tartar sauce that I do that has a little bit of heat with uh, horseradish and relish and mayo and um, what else do I put? Uh, lemon and garlic and just kind of like hand stir it. And to me, it's just like the fish and the proper tartar blend is like just deadly right yeah. especially on a sunny day and you got a little salad on the side or some type of taco salad or i i think i want to try that tartar sauce so i i like the sounds of that yeah i got the recipe i can share it with you yeah i i i think i'd like to give that a try i know i mean traditionally like you know you throw mayo and relish together and you kind of have a bit of a tartar sauce but then you put some dijon mustard and something that's going to give it a little spice a little more flavor a little salt and pepper and you know you can even throw some hot sauce on it yeah. yeah. Now, <coughs> I know my next adventure is going to be last fall. We had a chance to go down to Cape Breton to Wicogama. And oh, yeah. I've had some rainbow yeah, fillets in, say... my, in my freezer since we, since we came back. And it took me a long time to decide how I want to prepare them. And, of course, now that I've decided I can't do it, I've got a, <laughs> a small smoker, but it doesn't it doesn't generate enough heat. It's an electric smoker and it doesn't generate enough heat in the colder weather to, to keep a steady temperature. Right. So now, unfortunately I'm looking at these rainbow trout fillets that are, you know, that I caught down in Wicogama and I have to wait until we get some milder weather before I can dig the smoker out. And, yeah. You probably uh, don't want to turn the smoker on in the garage. Um, <laughs> I mentioned that uh, I didn't get a very warm response to the idea. Mm -mm. so but you know i'm lucky i live right next door to a, a really great local butcher shop and i talked to them because they do a smoked salmon and i talked to the owner and he told me and it's a very basic i don't want to necessarily give away his any of his secrets but it's a very basic marinade that he uses on his smoked salmon and i'm going to use the same thing on the this trout and you yeah. know i'm Okay, he hasn't even got to the fish yet, and I did have <laughs> supper. That is uh, that's a good looking pico right there. Thank you. Yeah. Why don't you Why don't you let the folks know at home know what what exactly you've got in that, Matt? So I just uh, diced up some tomatoes, uh, a little bit of Spanish onion. Um, I put some uh, chopped up um, cilantro, uh, some green onion, and then uh, about half a lime. And some salt and a little uh, little drizzle of olive oil, and then you give it a mix, and that's basically it. Um, sometimes I like to put mango in it. Sometimes in the summertime, you know, you get the nice mangoes at the store, so I'll dice up yes, little mangoes really nice. Um, I wasn't happy with the mangoes I saw today, so I left them out. But uh, that's that's my pico. I keep it pretty simple, and um, we have a lot of it in the summer because you know I got lots of tomatoes in the garden, and I mean nothing beats the garden tomato. No. Pico, right. And I grow my own cilantro out there as well. So, um, Spe Speaking of stuff you grow, do you have any of those uh, pickled jalapenos that we had down in Yarmouth? 
Um, I don't actually. Um, I had to go with the uh, just the store bought Jared version, but um, that's going to be uh, something I'm definitely going to grill more of in the summer. Yeah, they, they were good. They were really good. So, <clears throat> um, Matt, I, I know you're working away in the background there, but I'm going to throw a, a subject at Pete. And you know, Matt, feel free to chime in if you're if you're not going to cut your thumbs off or burn yourself. Uh, I'll do my best, you know. But uh, we're, we're, Matt's working on chain pickerel, and as we said, some people are so stuck on traditional species that they overlook some other great options. Mm -hmm. um, Pete, what other options do you think they overlook? Uh, here's. Here's one that we didn't talk about yet. And uh, Jesse uh, from the L House, the chef, he, he, he started talking to me about American eel. Oh. And I mean, there's a pretty big market. Um, they send them uh, overseas, but like American eel that's grilled, which some people might not consider, is spectacular. Like debone it, take the skin off, put some skewers in it, and throw it on the barbecue. I think, I think before you throw it on the barbecue, you probably want to steam it for a minute or two, and that kind of just gives it a little more tender flavor. And it's um, it's called unagi. The Japanese style, I think, is unagi kabayaki, and uh, that's like a teriyaki glaze over top of it. It's pretty like you can make a pretty simple teriyaki glaze with uh soy and um sugar i think it's soy sugar and um the rice wine and just blend it up and and uh brush it on and that that is a fish species that you know typically if you catch an american eel it's by accident and, and it's worm and hook yeah. but they they get three feet long and they come up all the rivers and that's now that's an underlooked species. I don't know how many people actually target those. Um, have you ever had an eel? You want to talk I about have, underlooked? <laughs> I have never eaten an eel. I have looked at an eel and said, um, "How how mad will I be if I cut that twenty dollar bait off and just let the eel keep it?" <laughs> um, but now you've got me a little bit intrigued. Uh, I, now that being said, I'm not going out and targeting them this summer. But uh, you know, if I catch one, I'll give you a call and. You know, you can, <laughs> well, that, really I would, that, that whole process from start to finish, the skinning, you know, everything else is something that would be totally foreign to me on an eel. So, you know, I'd have to have lessons. You just use the force. Use your natural instincts. My natural the, instincts the are to cut the line and let it go. <laughs> <laughs> well, then there you have it. <laughs> so, but yeah. It okay, was, well. Uh, that that definitely probably qualifies as the the top ranked, you know. We'll say overlooked species. Now, let's get to something. <laughs> let's get to something that maybe a few of our viewers might have tried. Yeah, I would say uh, like the brown bullhead. Bullhead. That's. Um, I mean, it's a catfish. It's uh, they've got uh, two fillets, like all of them, and no no more traditional type of preparation for catfish than to deep fry them like a cornmeal cornmeal or uh you know a little flour and a little you can deep you can do a beer batter on them they're uh they're a little tricky to fillet they're but so you know you take your time with it you pick away and uh you kind of it's a little bit more of a skinning process than it is a flaying for part of it uh but once that's off and you get the fillets off you know there are so many bullhead in the in the uh, in the river system that it, you know, it's the completely sustainable and it's delicious. I don't know. Is, I don't know if anybody else out there has actually tried them. If you, I mean, if I know. So I know lots of. I know lots of my friends have tried them. Like we'll just sometimes dare each other to try different fish. I mean, everything's <laughs> everything's edible. Just some things are better than others. <laughs> oh God! I yeah, I could see that taking a fishing trip sideways yeah, in a hurry. Yeah, exactly. So, but no, folks, if you've tried something different, um, you know, I, I we mentioned that uh, Jay Wilcox would be making fried, you know, fish and chips with bourbon. Have you tried bourbon, Pete? I know I haven't. Um, no, that's one of the few fish that I can say I have not tried. I haven't actually uh, targeted them yet. 
but uh, I know there's a resurgence um, in that fishery this year for sure. A lot of a lot of success happening, and that, that usually cues some folks up to kind of hit the ice and and target them. And and uh, from, but from my, what I understand, they're very good eating fish and put up a hell of fun. Yeah, I uh, I was hoping to get out. I've never really been an ice fisherman, but uh, everybody was taunting me and wanting me, and I I was actually looking forward to getting out this winter. And then, you know, stupid me went and you know <laughs> slipped, blew out my knee, and kneeling and crouching is not for me right now. And that you know, ice fishing without being able to kneel or crouch probably isn't going to work it's real well. Pretty pretty crucial part of it, yeah. So, but uh, you know, yeah, the. No, uh, that's the, I mean, ice fishing this, I love it. I go, um, I go regularly down in Renforth and I was in Meehan's Cove last weekend and, and on the topic of fish that, um, we're just, don't... Getting inv- we're just getting invited. If you look at the comment that's up oh, on the yes. screen there, we're, we're being invited for a burbot shore lunch. So uh, better book I, it in then. <laughs> I think we're going to have to look into that. I'm definitely interested in that. Um, so. Yeah, I was fishing in Meehan's Cove, and I got some uh, quite a few tommy cod. There was a, a, t- a ton of tommy cod, like at some point, two at a time. And uh, I've never really uh, brought them home to cook them, but I at, when I got home, I was looking, and uh, you know, apparently it's 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 a great fish for chowders. So, yeah, I could see that, and I mean, there is an abundance of them. So, I just got word that. Uh... Matt's starting to get some oil heated up. I think he's going to actually start playing with the fish a little bit. Okay. So why don't we take a spin over and see how our taco cam and Mr. Matt Zito's doing? Yes, sir. Look at that. Yeah, I just finished up that avocado sauce there. And uh, so now I'm just waiting for the oil to heat up. And I wish I could. I wish I could eat through the camera. <laughs> like I, I want to try that. that. That's why I made sure I had supper before we... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, it's it's a pretty simple sauce. It's, it's really good. It's just kind of something I came up with. Um, you know, uh, sometimes I find if, if you put too many things, like you do your pico and your guac and all that, it kind of takes away from the fish. So I thought, well, and, and there's another sauce I make without the avocado. It's uh, like a cilantro lime uh, sauce. It's basically sour cream, cilantro, lime, some green onions and garlic, and just blend it. Yeah. Um, but then I thought, well, why not just put the avocado in it? And then it's like the best of everything. So that's kind of how I came up with that. But it's basically avocado, cilantro, uh, clove of garlic, uh, some green onion, and you and sour cream and salt. And uh, I put a few jalapenos. It's got a little bit of heat to it. And you just hit it with a food processor. And uh, and that's it. Pretty yeah. simple. Is it bad that I now want to go eat a second <laughs> supper? Not at all. Yeah. Do you have this? Is he in your kitchen right now? No, unfortunately, <laughs> he's not. I think that's got to be the deal next time. He's got to come to my house and cook this stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, now, sir. Matt, are you? Uh, how close are you being ready? You, you to being ready to actually prep your fish? Uh, I'm going to start to do the coating now. Uh, the oil won't take too long there. So basically, this is my what I call double crunch fish tacos double crunch yeah so basically what i got in this bowl here is just like a, a simple batter and I, you can make your own you can use beer batter whatever i just got the package one for tonight the i don't even know the clubhouse brand name or whatever uh this is basically just going to act like a glue the batter is really just a glue but you know when it fries up you get that extra crunch too so basically what i'll do is take one of my pickerel fillets and, uh, what now? What size picker was that? That one there, I think, was about twenty-three inches, maybe. I, I can't remember that they, these ones were. Uh, these were ones I had in the uh, in the. Fr- well, I put was this the new one? Yeah, no, this was the one I, I caught in my own lake just a few days ago. It was twenty-three inches. Yeah, yeah. So, his his own lake. He's got a rough life, Pete. Yeah, he, I was uh, gonna say it's a you know, poor guy. Live, lives right on uh, Kinnisack outside of Halifax. And, okay. So just a thin coating of the batter, and then you just kind of cover it up with the uh, seasoned Japanese panko. I like to give a little pat so it really adheres to it. 
This is not your first time, is it, Matt? I've made many a taco. Yeah. <laughs> right. I just like that we have the taco cam going. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there you can see it's pretty, pretty thick coating. Yeah. Fry up super crunchy. And that's basically so, all there is to it. And uh, oh, the other thing I should mention is I like to dry my fish off. Yeah. Uh, if the fish is too wet, the batter won't stick. You know that the water will evaporate when it hits the oil, and, and it won't quite stick to the fish. So uh, dry it off. Some people like to put flour. I just make sure it's really well dried. And if I was just to do like a dry coating, if I wasn't going to use this double crunch method, uh, I like to kind of. So is this your uh, this? I, I get the feeling that this is like your go-to pick roll meal. This is like, this. Yeah, I actually just kind of um, when we were in Yarmouth. Actually, that was the first time I, I I've tried this recipe, and now I've kind of figured it out a little better. I really like these seasoned Japanese uh, breadcrumbs, but this is definitely my favorite fish taco. Um, and probably, I would say, yeah, our favorite fish recipe, the most popular with my family anyway. The, the, my well, young daughters like it and the wife likes it. So I'm good with that. But there's wait. a, you know, they're pretty versatile fish. I've done so many different things with them, you know. Um, well, that's not a great it. memory, Ian. Ian Cavanaugh <laughs> just popped up on the screen. You know, caught my biggest pickerel ever on Kinnisack. Followed by embedding a treble hook in my thumb. Unforgettable day. Yeah. Well, I guess that, <laughs> that was one of those days. Fun, Ian. That yeah, that's one fun. of those days that had its upsides and its downsides. You know what, though? Um, I would much rather take the treble to a thumb than get my thumb stuck in a pickerel's mouth. I'll give you that. There you uh, go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I can't. That's, uh, uh, you know what? There's, there's, uh, there's memories in that, right? Ian? Yeah. <laughs> there's definitely memories. And uh, it sounds like Terry Lynn wants you to drop a fish taco over to her house. Sure thing. Well done. <laughs> now, Matt, you say you've done a lot of different things with pickerel, and that's part of what, you know, I mean, as with, with fish yeast, we've always wanted to showcase variety, you know, multi-species. How about a, a multi-recipe approach to one of the lesser – I'm not going to say lesser known. A lot of people know about eating pickerel, but not a lot of people have tried it. So one of the less popular eating fish. Yes. Uh, kind of give us an idea how many different directions, because I, I kind of joked earlier before we came on the air that you could probably are almost to the point of being able to write your own pickerel cookbook. <laughs> um, so. Geez, I don't know. Uh, another really good recipe that, that uh, I make for the family is uh, – a prosciutto wrapped pickerel and it's super simple. I take my fillet, uh, I just <clears throat> a little bit of garlic powder. Sometimes I'll put like a grainy mustard, but not always. And then I just wrap prosciutto around it and put it in a pan. You don't have to finish it in the oven or anything. By the time the, the prosciutto is crispy on both sides, the fish is done. Um, that's a really nice way to do it. Very simple. Um, I've made, I've made Thai basil chain pickerel. I've made uh, sweet and sour chain pickerel. Uh, Another good thing to do with them, if, if you find it difficult to fill it and take the bones out, if you got a meat grinder, I grind them up with some raw shrimp, and I've made fish cakes with that grind, uh, a chain pickerel crab cakes. I've made wontons. I've made dumplings. I mean, my next thing I'd like to try is to make my own ravioli with it. But uh, they're, they're versatile, you know. It, it's there's, there's a couple tricks to it, like, when you're filleting it, the most important thing I tell people is keep it away from the slime. The slime's going to give it a really bad flavor if, if you start getting the fillets all coated in slime. So I'll really try to keep like a, a clean workspace. But they're a great fish, and, and most people I've made it for, and and you know some of the I guided a couple clients this year, and I cleaned the fish up for them real nice and gave it to them, and they messaged me back later and said, "Wow, those fish are great. Like I like we like them better than haddock." So. Okay, Matt, we've got a question coming in from, you know, this guy with the last name Patterson that's got a profile, a picture of a chicken on his head. I'm not going to say his family member. That might be. Um, is there a certain size of pickerel where you decide to remove the Y bone or just leave it in? So About 20 inches, 19, 20 inches. The 19 inches is, is probably the smallest I would try to fill it. It just, it gets difficult and you lose a lot. Um, 
anything under 20 inches, I usually will just take the fillet, skin it, uh, cut it into pieces, and then throw it in the meat grinder with some raw shrimp and, and grind it up. And uh, you, you don't really get any of the bones in, in the fish. Now, I did do a larger chain pickerel uh, the last time, and a few bones made it through because the bones in the larger fish are a little bit bigger. So, um, and I always run the grind through twice. I'll grind it once, I'll pick it up, and I'll put it back through one more time, and that usually does the trick. But if you're going to look to take Y bones out, uh, I, I usually don't mess with any fish under 20 inches for that. Yeah, well, and I mean, I've watched you and, you know, someone who's experienced at it, it's, uh, you know, you made it look pretty slick. Ian Cavanaugh is officially starving now. Um, <laughs> Ian, I hope you're somewhere close to... Uh, Ian might need to... Ian, Ian's right in front of the lake, too. He, maybe he can walk out there and put a hole through there, Ian, and uh, you, can, you can have some pickerel tacos tomorrow night. So... <laughs> No matter, and I know we're talking a lot about pickerel, folks, and if there's any other species that you're thinking of that you want to throw out there, drop a comment. You know, we'll we'll bounce any questions around that we can. But, you know, with Matt doing this, obviously pickerel is going to kind of dominate at least this part of the show. Um, summer versus winter, Matt. Pickerel is always, you know, so many people say, oh, I'm only going to harvest pickerel out of really cold water. Um I was with you in Yarmouth, and I think we proved otherwise. Traditionally, what's your approach to when to harvest pickerel? Uh, in my opinion, that whole winter thing is an urban legend, and I have a theory behind that, and that is that in the summertime, I think their slime coating is a little bit thicker. And so when people are processing the fish, they're breaking the number one rule, which is getting the fish kind of covered in, in the slime. And I think, I think that's what's happening. Uh, and I've noticed that because any of the fish I get in the winter, by the time you get them home, they're really cold and they don't have a lot of slime. I think the cold maybe dries it up or they don't produce slime. I'm not sure. That's something I noticed early on with pickerel. I was like, wow, they're, they're less slimy in the, in the winter when I'm, you know, when I'm processing them. And I think that's what it is. Because you get one in the pickerel and you put it on the board and it's like it's sliding right off the board. Like I, I, I put down one of those um, foot mats, like rubber foot mats to kind of hold it in place. Um, and I, I, that's my belief anyway, in my opinion, I don't notice a difference between winter and summer at all. Um, the first few times I've made pickerel, I did notice a strong flavor and I kind of researched it and that's what people were saying, keep it away from the slime. And, and that's what it was. The next time I was really careful, it was, it was much different. So I think, I think that's what's going on between the winter and summer fish. So, so basically you're saying it comes down to the way the fish is being processed. Um, and I would assume too that if, you know, a person catches pickerel early in the day and they don't get it chilled, you know, and, you know they've killed the fish, it's sitting in a, a bag or in a cooler, it's probably going to get a little sloppy if the meat gets too warm. But if they can get it into a cooler right away or get it processed right away and just chill the, the, the fillets, then... Yeah, I mean, I just, you know. I usually just kind of cut the gills, let it bleed out. And in the summer, I'll just have a cooler with ice in it and I'll just throw them in the cooler, keep them cool. Uh, that's, yeah. I mean, you have to, right? You have to. Yeah. I think no. that's, that's part of the tip. Um, anybody that's fished down South through Florida or Caribbean, and they always have a nice, a nice, uh, box ready to go. Like, you know, they bleed oh, the fish. Boy, here we go. Box. Whoa, baby. So, Ian, if you weren't hungry before, you are now, and you just asked a question, opinions oh on God. eating smallmouth bass. That is a conversation that can stir up quite a storm. Um, <laughs> anyone who the question, smallmouth bass? Opinions on eating smallmouth bass. Oh, okay. um, anyone who knows me knows that I came... So, you know, the, it's been a, 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 a good number of the last few years as smallmouth tournament fishing. I absolutely love it. Um, from that perspective, yes, I look at smallmouth bass and say, I'm going to catch them. I'm going to release them. But if someone chooses to, the only request I'm going to make is, number one, make sure your catch is legal. And number two, especially up north here, New Brown, like any, any of our Canadian waters, release the big spawners keep a smaller fish size class yeah. let the, the the mature adult fish go and continue to spawn and repopulate the species 
keep a few smaller ones within your legal limits and enjoy a meal. You know, that's, that's really my only, I've never tried it. I've been told it's delicious. Uh, not like I said, a, a, as a tournament angler, not something I've ever tried, but, uh, you know, just be responsible about it. And that goes back to what we touched on earlier about, you know, responsible and sustainable harvest is just be smart about it and, you know, take the necessary steps to, to look after the, oh, he guess his question was, how does the smallmouth taste? I can't answer that. <laughs> I, I've had smallmouth, uh, you know, like you got to wait till your post spawn and you got to make sure you're following the, uh, the, the legislation, especially with the regions that you're in and what your, your limit is, but it's usually only a fish two two fish a day, I think, uh, depending on what body of water you're in. So, but I mean, uh, you know, a, a 16, 18 inch, that's probably the right size, would you say, Donnie? Or is it, uh, I mean, you're not going to want to keep a 20-inch, five-pound smallie. They're, they're the ones that are producing the brood. Like, yeah. Yeah, but no, it's, they're delicious. No. I mean, 18, it's a clean, nice white fish. Yeah, 18 would probably be a little on the, the high end. Yeah, like a 14 to 16? Yeah, yeah that would Lot probably size, be like if you're, Yeah, that's what, a two-year-old fish? three-year-old fish well i mean it's uh, opinions vary but they'll say for a you know a four pound smallmouth in cold northern waters that fish is over 10 years old right so, they don't have the same you know. growth cycle i guess with the no um and yeah ben whalen just made a comment said that should be the plan with any fish let the spawners go and that's something that if you're going to target a specific species especially if your intention is to keep them and eat them know the spawning patterns of those fish because if you're targeting them during their spawn, they tend to be more vulnerable because their their behaviors change, and uh, you know you you could potentially be damaging the future of that body of water. So any any harvesting you do, do it responsibly. You know, put put the spawning fish back or avoid fishing during spawning seasons, and uh, look, at that. Hard, look at that. That's a perfect. Golden crisp. Might have to recruit you for the alehouse. This uh, I was going to say these are high praises coming from a a restaurateur, Matt. So don't that's say a, uh, that's a nice crisp. And, He's uh, gonna get, yeah, they don't take long. Number one rule: don't overcook fish. No, that is number one. You can cook them, and they just dry out. And we got to be careful though, Pete. I mean, you keep bragging him up like this. The next time he goes and flips that camera up so he's in frame, his head's not going to fit. I know. I better dial it back a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I'm. No, that looks it. good, Matt. Real good. Thank you. So, is anybody else hungry? Um, send your address to Matt. You know, he'll maybe, I don't know, the ship talk. The fish do you talk have, ship uh, very well. Matt, do you have uh, Skip the Dishes? At your location there, you can. Uh, I do. <laughs> can you send it out? Can we order this online? Yeah, that do you would have be a the... contact with Amazon drone delivery systems. I'll look into that. Yeah, <laughs> that would be an expensive Uber Eats delivery. <laughs> that, yeah, yes, it would. Might take some time to get to you, but it'll get there. It'll be cold, but it'll be there. So. These last two. Got a couple left to go in there. What do you say, Matt? Like four minutes? Uh, if that, yeah, three to four minutes. I kind of yeah. just kind of judge it by, like you, you saw me kind of poke it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of feel if it's if it's done, you know, if it starts to firm up. But really, on average, like three to four minutes. Three to four minutes. So it take long, especially with the pick roll, because you don't get a thick fillet the way you got to take the, the Y bones out. They're pretty yeah. thin, so they cook pretty fast. Well, I don't, I don't know about anybody else, but uh, I never thought I could sit and watch a taco cam for extended <laughs> periods of time. But this isn't hurting my feelings. That's so. a, that is uh, a taco cam is exceptional. Yeah. That really so you is. got you've got the tail fillet and the side fillets on there, like I'm just yeah. kind of looking at, at yeah, the cooked pieces. Uh, the tail fillets here. 
Yeah. Um, you can kind of see there's two cuts. That's because there's actually a second row of Y bones on the bottom of a pick roll. Yeah. So uh, I find it easier just to just to kind of cut both sides and pull that right out. And then you can kind of see the loin pieces, the one solid piece right up on the top here. That's usually a little thicker, eh? A little bit thicker, yeah. yeah. Usually a little bit thicker. No, nope. Matt, I know, like I said, Pickerel has dominated a lot of this conversation tonight, but I know you are a, a muddy water striped bass master down there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll take it. You'll take it? I didn't think you'd object. Uh what about what's your go-to striped bass recipe for those muddy water? And I guess there's my other question. Mm. Does that muddy water affect the quality of the meat in those striped bass? No, nope. most important, again, is bleed, bleed striped bass. Um, get as much of the blood out as you can. And uh, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't find that muddiness really affects the flavor. Um, my favorite recipe is very simple. I just, I basically dry the fish off really well. Like I'll take a nice chunk, I'll keep the skin on. And I just hit it with salt and pepper and I just get the skin super crispy, finish it in the oven and just maybe a little squeeze a lemon as I'm eating it. It's such a good fish. I don't like to mess with it. Uh, that's, that's my all time favorite. Just in an iron skillet, get the skin super crispy, brown the other side. Um, a buddy of mine, uh, told me to uh, finish it off with some tarragon butter. So I tried that with my last piece and that was, I'll probably start doing that again. Um, but uh, that's my favorite way to do it. I've done other things and it's good, but that's, that's my favorite. I've, you know, I've made a, I made a, an Indian curry with it before um, using like the belly pieces. That's another thing too. A lot of people just take like the fillet, they throw like the belt. There's so much meat in the belly parts and like the head, the cheeks, they throw it all away. Um, there's some good meat for chowder, you know, in those parts. Like obviously the the loins and the fillets going to be the best part, but there's a lot of meat there that you can use chowders or curries or whatever. Um, I even used the uh, I tried making a fish stock with the bones and the head this year that turned out pretty good. Jason Bellier chiming in. We should take Matt to first Eel River Lake. Might find a pickerel or two in there. Uh, Jason and myself and a couple friends of ours took off up there. I don't know, Pete, if you're familiar with First Eel River Lake up Canterbury Way. Uh, it's it's not easily accessible. Uh, from it's pretty much surrounded by private camps. And but a friend of ours, his family had a camp up there, and two little aluminum boats and four guys and hundreds of pickerel over a two-day trip up there on a weekend and oh really you know just an absolute blast so awesome yeah, no, I, I think we can take matt up there for a trip and on one condition he's cooking for he's the weekend cooking. bring the tailgate <laughs> bring the tailgate mise en place yeah <laughs> no problem no what's problem. the uh what's uh, what's your average size fish up there like let's talk about that uh, uh, i mean that that's a bad yeah, for Matt, where you're out there on your on the Super Lake there in the backyard. The Super Lake in the back. <laughs> the the um, pickerel producing. Geez, uh, I would say on average around 20 inches. Um, yep. I usually, I mean, you know, normally throughout the it's it's different in the spring and fall. They kind of they, they don't really go to the same areas. They're a little bit harder to to target. But any given day in the summer, I can go and get my fish over 20 inches uh a few of them through the summertime so i would i would probably say the average is around 20. you get a lot of small ones but there's a lot of big fish in kinsack i would say the average size in kinsack is a little bit larger than than a lot of the other places i fished but uh, there's no public access really oh okay. really get it. i mean you can get a boat in a smaller boat like something you can kind of lift off a, a truck or off a trailer um, but you're not going to be putting big boats that need a, a trailer in there. So I, it, it doesn't get a whole lot of pressure. So, and I think that's, you know, that's a big reason too. So, is it a, is it a deep lake or it? Yeah. There's some deep parts in it. There's some yeah. deep parts in it. All right. Nate, so, Nate was just mentioning Matt that you and I had, you and he had a, a pretty good day back in December. Oh What's yeah. Like? That was, that was something else. We went out there and, I would have been happy to get one or two fish for 
for supper and man we pounded off on them we just we got into a spot and they were just stacked in there and and uh yeah it, that was a great day really surprised by that so we have some avocado sauce it's, well, i should have showed you the crunch first let me lay this taco down here Yes, you see, I'll just rip this part off and uh, yeah. that nice white. You could just eat Jeez. it just like that. I did. I most of the times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would. I do I'd have a hard time getting to the taco if it looked like mm -hmm. that. So, yeah, no. The yeah. avocado sauce on the bottom. A little bit of chipotle mayo on the top. Pico. A little bit of the romaine heart. I've also done uh, the Baja style with the coleslaw is really good. Yep. Uh, yeah, why not throw a couple jalapenos in there? A couple jalapenos uh, this late at night never hurt anyone, what? Nope. And then finally... Yep. Lime. And depending on my mood, I might hit a little hot sauce to it too, but normally that's it. Okay, right. there's a question. Hot sauce and fish. I guess hot sauce in general, some people like some. Oh, what do we got here? That's right. one of my favorite hot sauce. I brought it up. I wish I could Toro taco. I wish oh, I right. could I wish I could shake it on your taco so you could try it. Where is that from? Toro Taco, that's uh, in Market Square, uh, Jesse spot there. So, but he, uh, it's got the uh, Hascap berries that they grow on the farm. Oh, Hascap, okay. And they make a hot sauce with it there, and it's just awesome. I didn't they've got a, they got a, They've got about We're five or six other. We're going uh, lots of fish in this one. Going extra fish. Yeah. There we go. Oh, I, you can eat so much fish. Look at that. All right. Now that's yes, a sir. fish taco. Sorry, guys. Let's let's watch it. Let's let's see if I turn off the fan. Maybe you can hear the crunch. I, I, I gotta eat. <laughs> I gotta eat now. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> that's a home run. Mm -hmm. That's a home run. Well, in the back. Oh, food. <laughs> yeah. Matt, you didn't think right now. It's all good. <laughs> okay, as far as my Jason Bellier, food porn. <laughs> as much fun as I'm having tonight, Pete. I think you and I are really getting the short end of the stick on this one. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie to you. I, like this, this sauce might be good, but you can't just drink it straight. It's pretty spicy. <laughs> Stephanie made that, and I like. I need a taco to go with it. So, can you pass me the taco through the screen? So I can eat it. <laughs> no, too good. No. Next time we need to do, we need to figure this. Yeah, get a little. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, Pete, do a solid. Make your neighbors some some fish tacos. <laughs> All right, Terry. Let's oh. get on it. Oh man. <laughs> so, but now, folks, and I mean, yes, we've talked about pickerel a lot tonight, and. You know, it's only a small part of what's out there, whether it be pickerel or trout. You know, if you're doing smallmouth bass, bullheads. Um, I, I heard a rumor that somebody may have tried some chub. <laughs> <laughs> that was the challenge last year. It was, and, uh, you know, I... Like I said, uh, everything's edible. Some are better than others, but you don't shy away from anything. And uh, my son, we went fishing in the spring there, and we were catching a bunch of white perch. And, of course, the chub are usually there. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to try it. So we brought it home, and I filleted it up, and it's white fish. You, you know, put a little batter on it, throw it in a taco, put some hot sauce, cilantro, this new avocado sauce I need to get the recipe for. Well, Delicious. Yeah, it, I mean, I think we've all caught our fair share of chub. Yeah, you can't yeah. you can't live in around here and and not. Uh, we not don't have any here. I haven't run into too many here. Some and uh, in like some of the smaller brooks, I've caught them. But I, yeah. well, that's really that's another reason to move to New Brunswick, Matt. 
for the chubs. <laughs> I tell you what, you send me some pickle tacos, I'll send you some chub, and you can try. Bucket loads of them. Sure. Bucket loads. We got some. I got some minnows in the garage that I throw those up. Can we see? Uh, I think you just you. don't you just don't you just eat those alive? Sometimes. That's the <laughs> the minnow the minnow challenge. Mm-hmm. I think I'll pass on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, no thanks, um, guys. I mean, I know, like I say, we've kind of bounced around a lot. If you uh, and don't worry, Pete, I'm not going to hold you to this. And Matt, <laughs> I'll let you finish eating your taco. I'm going to be nice and not go to you right away while your mouth is full. Appreciate it. But if you had one fish that you were going to catch and cook for the rest of your life, what fish would it be, and how would you want it cooked? Like gun to my head? Yep. Like I said, I'm not going to hold you to it. I just, if the hands were down, what would you go for? Would you go traditional? Would you go with an overlooked fish? I think uh, it's a toss-up between white perch and striped bass, but I think striped bass is where it's at. I think pickerel's probably right there too. Like those three... Again, I don't have favorites. I don't have a favorite band. I don't have a favorite song. I don't have a favorite color at all. Uh, maybe camo, but <laughs> you are a New Brunswicker. <laughs> but I do like I like I do like white fish, and I like those three top three. Maybe Hake would be in there just because I'm thinking about it this time of year. But I find it's like seasonal. So when the when the striper season's on, I want stripers, and when I'm catching pickerel, I want pickerel, and when smelt's on, I want smelt. So my my flavor profile changes with that, the the yeah. colors of the leaves or the lack thereof. Like well, that's, that's and that's that's, that's kind of that's following the diet of of the season. Exactly. And right now, pickerel's awesome, and look at those tacos, man! Like I'm, <laughs> I can't wait to make pickerel tacos. Mm-hmm. Have, okay, have you ever done pickerel tacos before, or have you ever seen yeah. them before? Yeah, yeah we, we, yeah, like we do them at the camp. Like I, I have a camp on the Wash de Moik, and uh, the pickerel there is like it's probably the number one sport species on the lake, and yeah. uh, so and we do we catch tons up there. So you know we've done shore lunch stuff with it. We've done tacos. Um, I'd like to get into a few more of these other uses that Matt's brought up tonight. I made some notes actually, because it's a pretty diverse fish. I've never ground it up. That's I, and I've got a meat grinder. So I I don't know why I haven't thought of doing that, but it's a great idea, especially doing some wontons and, you know, that Uh, uh, dumpling aspect. I love that. Yeah. I made pan fried dumplings. They turned out really good. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you had so, some so your... I, I, I'm having a hard time answering. So, gun to your head, I'd say depends on the season. What's happening? Depends <laughs> on whose fingers on the trigger and whether or not you actually think they'll pull it. <laughs> yeah. Because so. right now we're coming out of like the winter season and I'm thinking about stripers on the mare machine. I think, I think stripers would be a solid answer, anyways, just because of the quantity of fish you're going to get in one catch. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but I've no. had the hundred. I've had the hundred striper days. It's a exceptional fishery, definitely. And that's that's one of the beauties. And I, I just want to go back to your following the diet of the season kind of thing. You know, that's one of the beauties of the of the East Coast is so much diversity, and you know, you can do different things, different seasons, and that includes the species that you're going to fish and the food you put on your table. So, yeah, now, fo- fo- follow the calendar, right? Yep. Matt, same so, question. Same question to you, real quick though. One fish, catch and cook the rest of your life. The only one you're allowed to keep. I'm, I'm almost in the same boat as Peter. Um, I, okay, I, I got to think about this. I got to break it down because pickerel is the most versatile. I think you can do more with pickerel. I think like with the grinding it up and all that, but there, it's it's harder processing. Um. Stripers, delicious. I find it very close to halibut. Um, but I think I think if I had to eat one, it would be white perch, I think. I think I'd have to go with white perch. That's a, that's a lot of processing too, though. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, yeah, you're right. It can be. 
All right, change my mind. I'll go back straight fast. <laughs> not if you do the whole roasted fish. Uh, uh yeah. Easy. Well, I well yeah, but then you get into the scaling and all that stuff, and that can get kind of tough too. That's only if you want to. Yeah. yeah. But see, I like the crispy skin. I like the yeah, crispy I know. So, oh man. But I got a big tool actually. I should show people this because I tell everyone about it, and I got this scaler. Magic fish scaler, it's called. Yeah. Like five bucks at Bass Pro. You can see it looks like almost like drill bit heads, and that will tear the scales off any fish. I've done stripers with this in like 30 seconds. Magic fish scaler. I'm writing that down. It's the, I do not have one of those. I don't have enough fishing accessories. There's no such thing as enough. <laughs> if, you're, if you're looking to scale fish, yeah, uh, I would, yeah, right there. If, if you're looking for a place to come where someone's going to shame you about the amount of fishing gear you have, you've come to the wrong place. But here, the, the motto is there is never enough. I got. I have several rooms dedicated to it. Several rooms? You're doing well. Well, I got to spread it out so I can't see it all. Oh, not a bad, not a bad plan, really. Yeah, hide some here, hide a little there. But, so... We could literally talk about this all night because there's no end to the opportunities. There's no end to the options. Whether it's, like I said, whether it's trout, striper, pickerel, chub, which I'll admit is a new one to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can hit any body of water in this province or in these provinces here on the East Coast, uh, you know, and get yourself a meal. So get out there. Enjoy it. Enjoy what our, we have right in our own backyards. I mean, Pete, with you and your new role with tourism, this is part of what you're, you know, the message I'm sure you're trying to send is not just tourism and vacation, but the, the whole staycation element. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, we've got an unbelievable resource on the East Coast. Like we've got the St. John River system, which is spectacular for boating. And in every corner there's fish, right? Like mm -hmm. every difference, you couldn't count the amount of different species. Like people were pulling, pulling uh, flounder through the ice, you know, on the St. John river right now. It's uh, you know, so I, you know, back to that, but to me, it's about following the season and that's what keeps it exciting. And that's, you know, four seasons <laughs> equals four different fishing and hunting seasons in the province. So, you know, right now we're fishing smelt and soon we're going to start thinking about um, brook trout and we're going to get into uh, the sea run happening with uh, Gaspero and shad and then salmon and sea run trout and then stripers and then we're into the fall and uh, the summer and we're hitting the pickerel and smallmouth and you know and then you get into the big salmon in the fall and then there's a million other subspecies that you know you're searching out in small lakes like white perch and yellow perch and sunfish and chub and getting kids out to catch those species they, they just want to they just want to hook fish and have some fun so trying to engage the, the next generation you know as as a i have a couple of kids and that you know the, i remember the first time they caught fish like it didn't matter what the fish was it mattered that they saw how the whole thing came together so we get if we get some guys like you with the talent and skill that you have that you can pass it down and then you show them how to complete the process and bring it to the shore and have a shore lunch. There's no better, there's no better vacation or staycation you can have than that. You know, it's, it connects everything. You're with nature, you're having fun with your family and your friends. Beat that. You can't. And we got it right here in our backyard. It's, it's in every stream. You just need to take some time to, put the gear together and have the gumption to go for a hike or put a boat in or look for a lake. I mean, we've got Google maps and the technology that we have now makes it so much easier to target things. And if you're not sure, we have lots of pro uh, platforms, like all the Facebook groups that you can reach out. Like everybody's been is super helpful with all that stuff for new people, especially anybody that's uh, on those forums that has that experience, like, you know, let's do it. Hit fisheast.com. There's lots of resources. Just get out and wet a line, and hopefully it's tight by the end of the day. Well, that's just it. And, you know, the the, the people are what make the experience because, you, you know, it starts out with reaching out for a little bit of help, and then it's you and your family and friends, like you said, and, 
you know, I had the opportunity this summer. I mean, Pete, Pete we met at the restaurant, you know, Matt, we got to spend some time on the water together and the, the, the community in general across the Maritimes that the, is involved in this sport and involved in the outdoors, uh, you know, is going to give people an experience that's absolutely second to none. Yeah. And the more people that do it, the better it's going to get because we'll have more involved and we'll have more resources to spread around. That's the, uh, so we need to grow it out, get people involved and do more tournaments and have some more fun and do some more uh, family vacations and hitting different water spots. Now that we've got the ice fishing expanded to all the new lakes in the province, that's awesome. Endless opportunity. Endless opportunity for sure. But unfortunately, yeah. um, I saw a flash up on the screen there. Teresa Stoddard. That wouldn't be any relation, would it, Pete? Never heard of her. Never heard of her. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Great recipe for our next pickle tournament celebration meal. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Mom. That, my big my biggest fan. And the reason so, I'm here. So do you guys have a your 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 little family tournament or yeah, well, we do a uh, Father's Day tournament every year. Uh, and we're, we rarely win it, <laughs> but we always have a good time. Oh, Matt's going to eat another taco while I'm trying to wrap up the show. Matt, I don't know about can't this. Can't keep tonight. a good man down. I was waiting for uh, that, but it was just staring me in the face. I couldn't. I had to. So, Peter, thank you so much for joining us tonight, man. Um, yeah, I had a great time. See you soon. Uh, you know, definitely want to talk some more and. You know, get out fishing this spring when the ice, like I say, right now, I'd, I'd say let's get out on the ice, but uh, that's not happening for me this year. But uh, we'll get together this spring and get out, maybe maybe hit the Kennebecasis for some sturgeon or something just after ice out. Yeah, and then we'll be into the shad in no time. There you go. And that's, yeah. right, like I said, that's right here in my backyard. Last year, the guys landed here. I had the table set up in the backyard with the big 30 cup coffee urn. My wife had fresh made blueberry and chocolate chip muffins. And Yes, sir. Guys all landed here and had a little breakfast, and we spent the day along the river. So we'll have to make plans and, you know, do that again this spring and make sure that your name's on the list. Let's do it. Looking okay, forward to thanks it. You, my friend. Yeah, thanks for having me. We'll talk to you again soon. See you, Peter. <clears throat> now, Matt, um, I'm hungry. I'm sorry. No, you're not. No, you're right. no, you're not. Like I said, we could have gone on all night and you know, but that getting to see you cook that pickerel again, like you did, like I said, the last time I saw you do that was on the tailgate of a Dodge pickup. And uh, you know, a little different that, this time around, but a little different this time. But trust me, my stomach was growling. Uh, Terry Lynn, just so, thank you all for watching. I, I can't thank you guys enough for tuning in. This was a lot of fun tonight. I mean, we always, I always enjoy getting together every two weeks and shooting the breeze when talking fishing with Matt and whoever we have on for guests. But, uh, you know, big thanks to, to Peter for coming on tonight. Thank you, Matt. I'm sure it was an absolute sacrifice for you to have to cook and eat those tacos. Oh yeah. What a, it was, uh, it was, it was tough. Yeah. But, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, as always, our broadcasts will end will end up back on fisheast.com uh, or you can watch them here on Facebook later on. And uh, thank you for joining us. We're going to do this again in two weeks, every two weeks, Thursday night, eight o'clock. Stay tuned. You never know what's coming next. Matt, until next time, fish on and fish east. See you guys. Thank you.